So anyway, we want to welcome all of you to this very exciting time interviewing Steve Levine. And before that, just a few housekeeping things. We are not having a Q&A session because we want to maximize every moment of our conversation with Steve, but we will have follow-up information after this to give you information on where you can find it, record it, and ask you for your thoughts. Um, also, uh, we have here Edvich Simon, Director of Instructional, uh, Instructional Technology and Online Learning, and I'm Karen Decker, President of ICLS. Chris here is helping us with technology should we need it. And now I'd like to introduce Steve Levine. Steve is the founder of the America the Bilingual Project and the author of America's Bilingual Century, How Americans Are Giving the Gift of Bilingualism to Themselves. We're gonna talk about that today. It's been praised by two Pulitzer Prize winners, numerous scholars and language teachers, members of the Modern Language Association, and American Academy of the Arts and Science Commission on Language Learning, and many readers. And many of you are here on this call. We certainly are among fans of this book. America's Bilingual Century has also received praise from Marty Abbott, the former head of Actful, and one of uh, Steve's partners. Steve partnered with Actful and its Lead with Language program for many of the podcasts he created for the America the Bilingual Project. Steve calls himself an aspiring bilingual who made Spanish his adopted language about 12 years ago. Before then, he says he never really thought about being bilingual, but since then, that's all he can think about. <laughs> he shares his own story in his book, along with interviews he had with hundreds of other bilinguals. He also dismantles 12 myths about bilingualism in America, drawing on research that he conducted as an executive fellow at both Harvard and Stanford. Steve is an alumnus of Cornell, where he received his doctorate in sociology. He's also an alumnus of the American Association for the Advancement of Science Mass Media Fellowship Program. And now, we want to say welcome to Steve. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. Edwidge and I really love the book. Karen, thank you for, uh, so much. And Edwidge and uh, Chris, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thanks uh, to all of you who uh, read the book and, and my my, uh, I have to say that language teachers and language students are some of my favorite people in the world because they, uh, what they're trying to accomplish and, and the gift that they are giving, uh, the, uh, the gift of bilingualism. And, and thank you for uh, talking about the book. Uh, you left out a little of the subtitle, however, Karen. It's uh, how Americans are giving the gift of bilingualism to themselves their loved ones and their country, because I think- Oh, also, I forgot that last year. Yeah, I think there's also a, an important uh, uh, social aspect and, uh, and national aspect to uh, linguistic capital that, that uh, Americans are starting to realize. And I, I sense the country is ready. Uh, the country is at a tipping point, I think, in uh, changing our narratives about the American languages. Well, um, that's why we found ourselves, you know, pumping our fists and saying yes, yes to so many of the points that you made, because a lot of it we've been preaching and talking about for years and years. So before we get to some of those themes, why don't you tell us a little bit about after having a successful business career, you turn to language learning yeah. as your yeah. journey. Well, um, my, uh, my career actually started as a, as a science writer, as a journalist, when I was a, a young man in my 20s, right out of grad school. And, uh, and I loved um, pursuing that uh, career, but um, I decided I could probably make a better living for myself in business rather than in science writing. So my wife and I started a business and miraculously it, uh, it did fairly well and still is around today, being run by a very... Uh, wonderful CEO named Margaret Morosky. And uh, about uh, seven years ago now, I uh, retired from that career and went back to my, my first career. As, uh, and that's what I'm pursuing now, as, as they say, for my encore career. I got back into journalism and, and it all started 
uh, we were talking a little bit before we started about uh, drinking and at cocktail parties. And, and that's where it started because um, I would just casually mention that uh, I'm studying Spanish, estoy aprendiendo español, um, to strangers. And my goodness, the things people said to me just kind of knocked me back on my heels. For example, why bother? The whole world speaks English. Or why bother? Technology is going to make language learning obsolete. We're going to have these uh, Google implants and, and we're going to understand everything and, and, be a, and they can understand us. So a uh, problem solved. Um, other people said, well, you know, in Europe, everybody speaks three or four languages because they have to. But here in the United States, where would I even use another language if I spoke one? And, uh, and then other people uh, came up to me and said, oh my gosh, how are you doing it? Because I really want to learn French. And for some reason, they always whisper like it was a secret. I, I don't know. Yeah. Why, but <laughs> and, I remember uh, that, yeah. Have you seen that too? <laughs> you know, like, like, how are you doing it? They, they wanted to know uh, what the silver bullet is. Is, is, is it Duolingo or, or some podcast or YouTube videos or, or what? So- uh, And that's what I love about your book because you take us through all of that thought process. You know, should I use an app or, you know, should I take a class or why am I doing it? How long is it gonna take? All of those things that really right. hold us back. And you just, you just really talk about that so clearly. Um, and speaking of that, um, can you tell us uh, the word bilingualism, right? I mean, I think a lot of people think that it's, you have to speak two languages equally fluently at like native speaker level or higher. Right, right. Well, the, so you the, talk about it differently. The definition of uh, bilingual that I use is the one that, that most scholars use, including Francois Grosjean, who's a scholar of bilingualism, and that is um, using two or more two or more languages in your daily life. And uh, it can get kind of complicated when you say trilingual, and what do you say after tri? You know, quadrilingual. It doesn't quite roll off the tongue. And um, it turns out a lot of the benefits of, of speaking more than one language happened at, happened at two, at that binary uh, point. So, um, and I think the aspect of using uh, two languages most every day is also a very good one because uh, to really get the benefits, all of the many benefits of, of being a bilingual, uh, using it every day is, uh, is the best way to do that. So that's the definition uh, that I use throughout the book. Um, yeah, so I, I, think I think that would make people feel better, your definition, because I, I would think that, you know, oh, to be bilingual, I'm never going to get there. But in fact, it's not necessarily the case. Right. And I certainly don't mean uh, that you use both languages perfectly, not anything right. of the sort. But right. um, I suppose I consider myself a bilingual now, even though that my even though my Spanish is uh, at a intermediate level, I do use Spanish every day. I read it and write it and listen to it and uh, love the language. So from that aspect, I would consider myself a bilingual. But uh, yeah, Karen, you're talking about I, I totally understand that language learners want to know how. How should I do it? Nobody wants to waste their time. And just tell me the best way to do it, and, and, and I'll go that way. And, and I want to talk about some of the hows. But before we talk about the how, I want to talk about the where. And what I mean by that is it's important for language learners, someone who adopts another language as an adult, to be able to understand where in their lives their adopted language will live. And there can be many answers to that question. And your adopted language can live in, in more than one aspect of your life. But there has to be, you'll have to develop, a language learner who adopts another language will have to have those answers to where will it live in my life. It may be in your home life. It may be in your spouse or partner because they introduce you to another language and another world. It may be in your, in your uh, work, in your profession. It may be in your religion. 
in, the, in your church. But it has to be someplace real in your life, doing something that you are, enjoy doing, uh, let's hope, and, and that is part of your life anyway. Because no matter how motivated and disciplined any of us are in learning a language, at some point we have to stop studying and learning per se and start living in the language. And, and that happens when you find your where it will live. And, and by the way, this isn't my idea that I came up with this brilliant explanation. Uh, I learned this from uh, Guadalupe Valdez, a professor at Stanford, who uh, explained it to me. And I tell that story in the book. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question about the audience. Um, in your book, you talk about the many ways to learn a language from falling in love. Uh, going on an immersion, taking a language class, doing Duolingo. Uh, what audience did you have in mind when you wrote your book? And what is the most important message that you were trying or that you wanted to convey? Yes, uh, thank you, Edward. I, I was writing it for a, uh, an adult audience. And that's why part one of the book um, is, is dedicated to how adults learn languages. Part two of the book is dedicated to how, how to raise um, bilingual children or children as bilinguals. And part three deals with those myths that Karen was uh, talking about, which I love to talk about, those, uh, the uh, dozen myths that we talk about. We'll get in the there. Book. Yeah. Um, so uh, as far as what's most important, I think that when we, when we talk about the how to learn a language, my my answer to that question is yes. Try, uh, if it's a Duolingo, if it's a uh, Pimsleur, if it's a language class, if it's a private tutor, if it's watching movies, my answer to all those questions is yes. Try them out, experience them, see what you um, respond to. And there will be many different ways that you will, um, learn your adopted language and, and enjoy that adopted language. And just as we learn how to live from many different people that we encounter in life, we learn how we learn our adopted language from many different sources. It's also a question, I think arithmetic can help us here a little bit too. Language learners tend to underestimate the number of hours that it truly takes of exposure to a language before one starts getting comfortable in it. It's not hundreds of hours, it's thousands of hours. So that's you know, my I, next question. Yeah, okay, go, you, ahead. go ahead and ask it then. Yeah, going along with that is you said, uh, you titled one of the chapters, Learn French in 30 Years, <laughs> which I love. Um, and then you wrote, I'm trying to sell you on the idea that taking a long time to learn your language is actually a good thing. So, you know, we've been telling this for years and years to our students and clients and so forth. But as you know, it's an uphill battle with some of the marketing that is out there. Yep. And so um, learn I French in 10 days. You, yeah, that's still around yep. somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, I especially love how you talk about acquiring what you call buds of bilingualism. Yep. I, that sticks in my head. I love that. And also flowers of fluency. Yep. And, and so what you're saying is that, you know, you may only be, a, be able to say a few phrases if you're traveling, but that's a bud of bilingualism, which automatically opens up into a whole nother world. So yep. can you tell us a little bit more about how fast is overrated? That's yep. your quote. Yep. Okay. So sometimes uh, we do learn language fast and vividly and hooray, you know, let's celebrate those times. But other times the most powerful learning takes place when we're struggling, when we're, when, and I have a great Spanish tutor who lets me struggle. You know, I'm, I was trying to think of the other, the other day of the word for crew in Spanish. And finally I came up with it. I think it's a, uh, um, tribulation, which is kind of an odd word, but, um, but she knew I was struggling and she made, she let me struggle. And I finally came up with it and finished the sentence. And that's sometimes how we learn best is when we struggle. So, um, 
as far as the time involved, you know, I have met many people. <laughs> it sounds like all I do is go to cocktail parties, but I did meet <laughs> this person at a cocktail party. He said, you know, I took four years of French in, in school and I can't utter a sentence. Have you guys heard that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's it's kind of weird in a way. I mean, nobody says I, I took high school band for four years and, and, and they're disappointed <laughs> they can't step on the stage with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> Right. Uh, but for some reason, we expect um, to be able to do that with a with another language. And when you actually look at the number of hours that one spends in French class, whether it's in high school or college and add it up, you come up with maybe a couple of hundred hours. OK, it can be a very important foundation. It can be marvelous for that. But is it going to get you comfortably so you're speaking with the waiters in Paris? No way. That's thousands of hours, as you know. So I think um, it's important to uh, be realistic with the amount of time that's involved, enjoy the process every step of the way, and realize that it's a lifetime, uh, it's a lifelong journey. And let, let me get this into- This is where I was clapping and, and, and doing this. <laughs> oh, good, I'm sorry I missed that. But- um, No, I mean, when I was reading it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Um, you know, I, th I think it's important to do a little bit of math here. So if, if you're totally immersed in a, in a language, let's say uh, all of us uh, went to um, Portugal, okay? Because I don't, I don't think there's any, uh, the three or four of us are not Portuguese speakers. We went to Portugal and we lived there for two years straight. And all we did from from the moment we woke up to the moment we went to sleep was read, hear, and try to speak Portuguese. After two years of total immersion, we will have racked up something like 10,000 hours. That's a lot of hours. And we sort of know, you guys are language professionals, we'd be fairly comfortable in Portuguese after two years if that's all we did, right? right? 10,000 hours. Okay, now let's say we're at a cocktail party. We've got our 10,000 hours of Portuguese and we're at a cocktail party in Lisbon and we're speaking to someone who's 20 years old. That 20 year old has not 10,000 hours of experience, but 100,000 hours of experience. And let's say we next talk to a 40 year old. They have 200,000 hours. We have 5% of their hours. So do you think there's gonna be a difference in how they use the language and how we use the language? We can understand Portuguese, we can talk, speak the pleasantries, but we're not gonna have the, comp, the uh, cultural references. We're not gonna get the jokes because we haven't lived in Portugal for 20 years or 40 years. And so I, I wanted to go through this math to, this is the take home message that it's important to know that it takes a lot of time but also be patient with yourself and realize that it's a lifelong journey and that you can enjoy it every step of the way. Exactly. And along that way, you have to be able to be vulnerable, uh, which is a theme that you discuss about showing, vulner showing vulnerability is exactly what holds most adult learners back. And we certainly see this in our language classrooms. Our students are professional adults, very good at what they do. And then suddenly they're in the role of, in another part where you, you talk about feeling stupid. And yep. you know you have to allow yourself to go there, as you said, have patience, yeah. laugh, and so forth. And <laughs> so how do we, I mean, you've already talked about adopting your language, living your language, and also proficiency versus perfection. I think yes. that's really an issue. How can we help them get over these yep. fears? Yep. Well, it's, boy, is that an important question. And the, the subject of vulnerability um, by itself uh, has been uh, well discussed by an author named Brene Brown. Some of you may know. She did a wonderful TED video called The Power of Vulnerability. And she's written many books on the subject. And people, uh, adults, normal adults like all of us, think that showing vulnerability is a sign of weakness. More often than not, it's a sign of strength. 
it's a sign of saying, hey, um, I'm not perfect here. Can you help me get better? Even business leaders, smart business leaders will do that. I don't understand the engineering situation. Can you explain this to me? And how do we, how do I understand this? And how do I get better? I, good leaders do that. Good language learners um, can get to that point where they feel confident enough to start having conversations. And I did have an interview with uh, Louis Von Ahn of the, the founder of uh, Duolingo. And he said that the language learners that don't care about sounding stupid, they're the ones who make the most progress. The problem is only about 20% of the population fits in that category. 80% of us, myself included, don't want to sound like a blithering idiot. You know, <laughs> more, more than is absolutely necessary. And so the purpose of Duolingo, and I think the purpose of other um, computerized language situations is to help humans um, practice and, and, and feel more confident so that they can then get to the point of having genuine human to human conversations. I think technology can be a wonderful um, addition, another arrow in our quiver, a very important one. Because, uh, and Ray Bradbury, the science fiction writer said this years ago that, that computers are not judgmental, not unless we program them that way. I mean, inherently they're not judgmental and uh, we don't care about sounding stupid to an app. So we should sound stupid to an app, and that will give us the confidence to uh, start sounding a little childish to our fellow adults. Well, speaking of technology and maybe more science, um, as you probably know, DNA testing is very popular these days. There are all these sites, and uh, you, you spit in a little cup, and you send it off, and they tell you where you come from. And people seem to really want to know where they come from. And so my question is, do you think that learning the language of your grandparents, like you put it in your, in your book, uh, is a deeper way to connect with your roots? Oh my gosh, it sure is, it sure is. And one of the most exciting things happening in the United States now, and I think in other countries as well, is people recognizing that they don't have to give up their heritage language, that they can become completely um, fluent in English and have their heritage language. And part of it is um, a technological change. You know, the, the American narrative about my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents, they purposely did not teach the heritage language to us or to their children because they wanted us to be good Americans. They were so happy to be here in the United States. This is kind of one of our founding myths as a, as a country. It's not a myth, it's a reality. It's what, it's what immigrants did, particularly before 1970. And, you know, were they patriotic? Of course they were. Were they practical? You bet they were practical. Immigrants tend to be practical people. And before 1970, let's call it, um, it wasn't practical to travel back to the home country, not when you had to do it on a steamship and when it was very expensive. And communication technology of the day, handwritten letters, which took weeks to arrive. Jobs that were available for the immigrants and their children were local jobs. They were English speaking jobs. Contrast that with today. Today, it is practical, absent a pandemic, to go back to the home country and people do it regularly. And the communication technology, well, look what we're doing right now, right? It's, it's, a, it's a, far, a far distance from the handwritten letter. As much as I love handwritten, handwritten letters, we've moved beyond that technologically. And as far as the jobs are available today to immigrants and their children, clearly they see the benefits of being able to be professionally bilingual and biliterate in English and another language. And that's exactly what they're doing with dual language schools and with heritage language programs. It's a very exciting change in the United States. And um, our narrative hasn't quite caught up with what's actually been going on for the last 50 years, but it's, it, I think it will catch up pretty soon. 
so I want to go back a little bit to the myths. You said that this yeah. is your book that you were excited about. Um, so, and as language professionals, we've heard them all, um, but it was really great to see how you took them one at a time and, and debunked them. Um, a really enduring one is that uh, it's better to learn a language when you're young. And, and there is some truth to that. But can you tell us a little bit about what unique skills adult learners bring to the table when they tackle a new language? Sure. Well, the very existence of polyglots, however you'd like to define them, let's say people who speak five or more languages, clearly they had to learn those additional languages as adults, right? You can't learn all of them. You can maybe learn three languages, maybe even four as a child, but not more than that. <laughs> And uh, so you learn it as an adult. There, uh, you mentioned the advantages of learning a language when you're young. Well, certainly you get to use it, use the languages your whole life, which is an inherent advantage. But it is also true, biologic or yeah, biologically, physically, that our hearing is best when we're very young, and our hearing gets, you know, uh, progressively not so great as we age. So one of the challenges for adult language learners is that they have trouble discerning the subtle differences in pronunciation um, that children can more easily hear and therefore mimic because you can't say something you can't hear, right? right. So it has been observed that adult language learners struggle with the accent and, and will be um, perhaps always perceived to be not a native speaker. However, I think that's perfectly okay. As you guys as language professionals know, there's a big difference between pronunciation and accent. It's important to pronounce words correctly, but accents vary all over the place. And we love accents, right? I mean, we, we, uh, it's part of what charms us about the different people we encounter in life. So I think an adult uh, language learner, unless you're James Bond on a mission, you, you, you can sound, when you speak Russian, you can sound like an American speaking Russian, and that's just fine. You know, they'll probably like you even more for it. Um, the better you can speak the language, the more impressed they'll be. But you don't have to, I don't think we have to give ourselves that high bar of sounding like a native. It's just, it's unnecessary. Um, so that's, that's one thing about accents. So that's part of the perfection thing. You don't have to be perfect in your accent. People still are listening to how you communicate. Yeah. Right, right. Another myth? Yeah. Oh, there's one you mentioned was that everybody in the world speaks English. You talked about that too. Boy, is that important. And I, and I think um, American children and children who grow up in uh, an English speaking country uh, this is a real um, danger that they can fall into to think because English seems to be taking over the world that they don't have to learn another language. So here's, um, I wrote two chapters about that and, and here's where I come down on, on that question. The English is spreading around the world, that's true. And if you want to be a tourist, and if you want to buy things, the world will try very hard to accommodate you in English. And you can travel the world in your, your uh, cushy English and uh, from, from Taiwan to, to Singapore, to uh, Tibet, to uh, Tangiers, they'll, they'll try to accommodate you in English. And, uh, and being a tourist is not a bad thing. Tourism is a very important uh, positive force generally in the world. It gets people together, it gets people seeing other things, it helps economies. However, it's not the most important thing that humans do when we travel internationally. More important than that is professional work of all types in medicine and healthcare and business, in development work, in defense work, the kind of professional work. And if you're trying to operate as a professional internationally and all you speak is English, it's like showing up at the big leagues with your shoes tied together. You're just at a fundamental disadvantage. 
because the English that's spoken around the world is like a veneer. It's thick in some places and thin in most places. And, you know, you can get a room with a view maybe and a quiet table for two. But if you're really trying to operate professionally, um, the world does not operate professionally in English throughout the whole world. So one of the uh, important uh, concepts about this is if you want to buy something, you can do that in your language. If you want to sell something, you better do it in the language of your customers or your competitors will. And when I say sell something, I don't just mean soft drinks and automobiles. I mean concepts. I mean um, development work. And even beyond selling, collaborating. The, the world's biggest problems, the biggest challenges in the world from human trafficking to climate change to um, uh, global economics, these, these are inherently collaborative problems. There are multiple stakeholders from many different cultures and languages. And being a bilingual helps you be a better collaborator, it gives you the empathy to understand there's more than one ways of looking at something. And so, yeah, there's a whole world speak English, sort of and sort of not. And so speaking um, of culture, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. The culture that you mentioned is making me think about other things you talk about in the book. And that you talk to a lot of language teachers and so forth. And it was always, yeah, but it's not just the language, it's the culture. And I think you have some stories about when that finally hit you. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, when I was talking to my, one of my own long suffering language tutors and I was uh, telling her about this book I enjoyed called uh, Nobody Knows the Truffles I've Seen. Now, a native English speaking American will laugh at that because we know it's a play on words. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen, an American spiritual. But my tutor who speaks perfect English, you know, didn't get that at all. Why should she? I mean, that's kind of a deep cultural reference. And those are the kinds of cultural references I wouldn't understand at all, no matter how good I get at Spanish about the the culture and uh, she came from Colombia, you know I couldn't mention the the top uh, ballads in Colombia and the and the famous singers their equivalent of Frank Sinatra, of course I know Sh Shakira but beyond that I kind of <laughs> fall fall apart. So um, it takes a long time to learn the culture and the cultural references and that gets back to what we were talking about before about your ten thousand hours compared right. to speaking to people who have 100,000 or 200,000 or more. Well, along that language journey, and I know you referenced this a little bit when you were talking about um, Louis Van On from Duolingo, but we get asked all the time, and I get asked you know, at cocktail parties, so to speak, you know, what's the best app for me to learn a language? I don't have time for a language class, but boy, I'd like to have an app. And I don't really know what to say. I mean, there's so much out there. and. But what I'm interested in is not so much a name of a, an app, but how the apps, as you mentioned, help part of this, you know, adopt your language approach. Mm -hmm. I, I think they, they, they can help. It's what uh, Guadalupe Valdez calls bits and pieces of language. And um, they, can, they can help you build your hours of exposure that can lead to being more comfortable and, and to lead to having authentic conversations with humans. I think there's a, another, um, it's not just the apps that are designed for language learning that are so fascinating today. I think it's the technology that can be switched over to an adopted language. So especially if you're learning one of the main, uh, the major world languages, let's say German, you can program your car to be in, in German. You can program your, your phone, your computer, your bank ATM, and you can give yourself a digital fingertip um, exposure to the language in your digital life. And God knows we all spend probably more time than we want to you know, looking at our computers and dealing with our computers 
and we can have them engage with us in our adopted language. And then we have the glorious world of movies and series, right? On Netflix and, and the rest of the streaming services, you can dial in your language, your audio language, and you can dial in your subtitles. What a boon to language learning. And remember when I was talking about where your adopted language will live in your life? Well, one of the places Spanish lives in my life is watching movies. My wife is, is also an intermediate Spanish speaker and will put up with me when I, when I watch the movies and the series in Spanish, um, sometimes with subtitles, sometimes not, depending. It's a glorious thing to do. And um, that's something that has been made uh, possible by advancing technology and hooray for language learning. And that's why um, we these all these tips are wonderful for students and teachers alike, because we really want students to leave a classroom situation and become a self learner. And all these things you're talking about are really, you know, very helpful along the way. You know, you mentioned language classes, and I, I think language classes are, are sometimes unfairly criticized. I think it's because people expect too much. Um, they should expect in a language class to get a solid foundation, to get some good, uh, a practical foundation for their learning throughout their whole lives. And, and they will get that with good language classes. But the people who think, well, I took, you know, four years of French and can't speak anything, I think they, they miss the point about what the language classes are, are, are for. My advice to people is if you find a great teacher in a great class, go for it, man. That's like gold. And, but don't expect to be able to walk out of your final exam in your French class and, and go be conversant, uh, let alone fluent in French. You know, they give you the foundation that you then build upon in all ways in your life. In other words, you take responsibility also for the learning process. Absolutely. Right. Uh, I really like this, uh, the way you phrased it, uh, you to build your hours of exposure. There's the class, there's the app, there's the movie, there's the radio station, there is your phone. But at the end of the day, it's it's on you. Um, I want to bring the conversation back a little to your book. Uh, I'm going to briefly share my screen to show the book uh, cover here. And here we are. All right, can you see the book cover? There it is. Uh, America, America's bilingual century, how Americans are giving the gift of bilingualism to themselves, their loved one and their country. And the reason why I wanted to bring uh, up the book cover is because, and I'm going to unshare here, is because all proceeds from your book are earmarked to support language grants that the America the Bilingual Projects awards. Can you tell us a little bit about these grants? Yes, a conversation core grants. We're looking for organizations that uh, promote bilingualism. Um, one of them is, um, uh, actually I mentioned Guadalupe Valdez. She is emeritus now at Stanford and started a wonderful organization called English Together that trains not language teachers, not tutors, but coaches to help others learn English. Another is, a, is a, a venture up in Maine called Multilingual Mainers. There's a professor at uh, Bowdoin College who uh, sends uh, Bowdoin undergraduate bilinguals into elementary schools to become role models for immigrant children and to reinforce the value of heritage languages for them. So those are two examples of the kinds of organizations that we, we support with our Conversation Core grants. This is great. Thank you. So I laughed at your story about the cocktail party, which you, you shared with us and some of the things that people say. But you've noticed um, and observed in many ways and in many places that there is a thirst for learning languages. 
And yeah. maybe if I can summarize a little bit, some of the reticence is because of the things we talked about, you know, vulnerability, you know, it takes too long, uh, the myths that are out there and so forth. But um, Edvige, do you wanna ask the last question? With all of this, the most important thing that I think that everybody wants to know, and you can talk about it as much as you want, is Edvige. That question is, is it ever too late to learn the language? <laughs> um, I don't think so. And I did interview Laura Carstensen, um, who's the head of the Longevity Center at Stanford, this very question. And she said, clearly not. We can, we can learn throughout our whole lives, absent some serious dementia. We all learn, and it's what we want to do. It's what uh, we call lifelong learning. So... Absolutely, you can learn a language at any age. You may struggle a little bit with hearing, um, but that can be, you can compensate for that. And adults have learned other ways, other advantages that actually make them better language learners oftentimes than young children, because we know how we like to learn. We can be disciplined. We have another language, obviously, that can serve as scaffolding for uh, learning uh, another language. Um, Karen, I just want to touch back real briefly on the thirst. Well, you, have, you have plenty of time, so go ahead. Okay. And, and why uh, we have this thirst to be bilingual. You know, uh, clearly we are, we are born with two eyes and two ears and two arms and two legs. And, and we are born as human beings with the ability to learn and speak two languages simultaneously from infancy. And I think that the widespread monolingualism that exists in the United States and other large nation states is a relatively new phenomenon that really rose with the large nation states. And I think some of us who are monolinguals um, feel this thirst and maybe we don't know why. And, I, and I'm speculating here, but I think the why may be that we just feel in our bones that we are naturally made to be bilingual. And when we're not, we, we sense we're missing something. There's, there's also a, a well-established um, pattern of human behavior. Uh, anthropologists talk about um, marrying uh, outside the tribe, outside the language group. Right. And this, um, this process is very widespread in traditional societies. And that means that little baby humans grow up hearing one language from their mother and another language from their father, and maybe yet a third language from the tribe. Anthropologists call this exogamy, marrying outside of your tribe. It's widespread. It's what humans tend to do not universally, but, but most times. And um, so our, all of us humans were built with this capacity. And I think there's been evolutionary pressure on humans throughout the millennia to become little language learning machines who are just programmed and ready from day one to be bilingual. So I, 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 this is against speculation on my part, but I think some people feel this uh, for whatever reason, more intensely than others. You can certainly live a wonderful full life as a monolingual, just as you can live a full life having only one arm or one leg, but none of us would wish that for ourselves. And I think it's the same with languages. And so I think you said in the book that if you ask somebody, are you happy being monolingual, they would say no, but no bilingual is ever unhappy with being bilingual. You said something like that, right? I've <laughs> interviewed hundreds and hundreds of bilinguals and monolinguals. I've never met a monolingual who's happy about being monolingual. They may think it's not worth the effort, but it's not like they go around saying, thank goodness, I only speak one language. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, back with the, about the learning, it's too late or, and learning as a child. There are some parts of the book that we haven't talked about where you talk about um, children. And I was very interested in the sign language. Um, you talked about signing kids that, you know, who parents are, are hearing. 
but they sign to their kids. Yeah. And and they may be hearing children as well. Um, yep. So and and I have a, a granddaughter, and my son is actually signing a little bit to her, and it I didn't realize you know how you know that symbol for you yeah, know, hug for or love. love. Yeah. So yeah. can you talk a little more about that? Well, I'm happy to say I'm a grandfather now too, and uh, my children are using sign like basic ASL to communicate with uh, their two little boys, and yeah, it's a it's a wonderful gift that the the deaf community has given to the hearing community that uh, some basic American sign language in the, in the United States it would be ASL. Um, it is a wonderful way to communicate with children when they're when before they can speak. Mm -hmm. So you can actually give them a language and they can give you some signs, you know, I want more or um, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I, I hurt, uh, I love you. And before they can speak, it's a wonderful, wonderful gift. And I and I think it's becoming kind of mainstream now among young parents, they kind of uh, understand this. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, maybe we have time for one more myth, um, um, because this is one that I've, I've heard a lot um, from adults. Uh, I'm not good at languages. Uh, oh, yeah. The mm -hmm. idea of is self-efficacy, it's self-defeating. I'm not good at it, so what's the point? Yep. Can you talk a little bit about this, this uh, attitude towards language learning? When people say that to me, I say, well, how good are you at English? And they, they kind of like say, well, good, really good. <laughs> and, I, and I just let them think about that for a minute. And, and the answer is, well, however good you are at English or your native language, you can be at another language too. It's a, it's a question of part motivation and part the hours that you spend dedicating to it. I think a lot of people come to that point prematurely because they have unrealistic ex expectations. <laughs> The ads we we're talking about before, you know, learn French in 10 days, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I think if you have realistic expectations and um, learn to laugh at yourself and, and be patient with yourself, and um, it's going to take time and enjoy the process every step of the way. And also about, um, you know, adult skills, what they bring to the table, which we talked about a little earlier. Would you say that um, the fact that you've lived life longer and experienced so many different things um, and your understanding of the world would help you, even if you can't speak the language, you know, connect with the culture? Absolutely, without, without question. And um, one of the, the delights I have in learning Spanish are expressions that are just completely different from the English. Like I was reading a book the other day and they talk about a Montaña Rusa, a Russian mountain. I'm thinking, what? What's a, what's a Russian mountain? What are they talking about? Well, you French speakers know, because I think it's the same in French. It, it means r roller coaster. Right. And that makes you look at your own language, and in this case, English. Well, why is it called a roller coaster? That didn't really make much sense either. And um, that happens all the time when you learn a new language and learn new ways of, of uh, saying things. It uh, enlarges your life, enlarges your perspective, which is one of the joys that uh, bilinguals experience. And you have to make some clunky mistakes along the way while you're learning and <laughs> have people laugh at you and uh -huh. you know, get the wrong directions. But most of the time, as you said, and it's certainly been my experience and experience is uh, just by making the attempt of communicating at whatever level you can speak. I mean, people sometimes will just adopt you and invite you for lunch. And Absolutely. I've experienced that in so many different cultures. And yep. um, tell us, we have a oh, few minutes left, but tell us about your friend that was it you were studying German or was it a friend of yours who helped him out? He had to pass his test to get his master's degree. He was in Europe. Don't remember uh, that one. Oh, I don't remember that one. But you remind me, uh, Karen, that um, you you mentioned earlier buds of bilingualism. Yes. And, and I want to talk about that. It's these are the the pleasantries of um, the basic ex learning a few basic expressions. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to apologize for our president. You know, just the basics. 
like that. <laughs> Apologize for president seems to be a universal, you, no matter what country <laughs> you come from. <laughs> but, um, you know, when I first was a language learner, I thought, well, that why, why sound like an amateur with these, these um, uh, pleasantries, what I call buds of bilingualism. And I learned by interviewing lots of bilinguals that the more sophisticated the bilingual, the more languages they spoke, the more they did this. And, and uh, I started doing it myself. And boy, does it, does it pack a lot of power uh, for the punch. And um, people generally just love it. And, uh, and it is a step toward uh, bilingualism. So you can be adopted by those who speak the language you're trying to adopt as well. That's a nice concept. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I had to use, I had to, and I was pulled aside um, going through security in France and the one about what do you think about your president or I apologize for your president. I didn't <laughs> say that, but because I was like, I don't know who this guy is, but he was asking me in French while he's going through my bag and everything, you know, yeah. so what do you think of your president? And um, I just said something glib in French and I passed the test because he laughed. Uh huh. There you go. So that's when I felt that I was more than the buds of bilingualism. You, well, you clearly are. You clearly <laughs> are in French. You know, I, I uh, typically say, um, estoy aprendiendo espanol, uh, me, puede ayudar, me puede ayudarme, which means I'm studying Spanish, will you help me? And once you say that in whatever language, people open up, and of course they will. And you, if you set the uh, expectations pretty low, and uh, <laughs> it, it generally is a wonderful experience. And I think we've all been in that situation where we've studied a language and we can say something really fluently with a great accent. And there you are, you know, not in your language class in a situation and you ask a question very, you know, really well. And the person thinks you're fluent and they start goop, going yep. at it and you're like, whoa. And, <laughs> and then you're you like, have... check, please. Yeah. <laughs> so in other words, you might start off with what you suggest. I'm learning X yeah. language. Could you please be patient or help me. Yeah, it works for me. So we have a few minutes left. If uh, I would like to give you the opportunity to talk about anything else you would like to share with our audience. Well, there's there's another myth that comes to mind, which is, um, you know, some people say, well, uh, programming, you know, computer science, uh, coding is a language too, and that's what we should be teaching young children today. And I think some st American states have actually allowed that to substitute for right. uh, world languages. Um, I think it's a false dichotomy. And, and I won't debate whether programming is a language or not. I'll leave that to other experts. But it's a false dichotomy because you, we can teach programming in a language. You can learn how to program in German or Chinese. And the, where the growth is really happening, as you know, in the United States and the world over, are dual language schools, where they teach half the day in, one, in the dominant yeah, state language, the and mm -hmm. the other half of the day, or the other day, it depends, different formulas, um, in the target language. And the, the data on this are, is, are very clear. The children excel monolingual educated children in the dominant language, as well as becoming bilingual in the process. So it's, uh, there, there is no, it's a false dichotomy when you, when you say we should be teaching programming and not language. The, the fact is today we know that bilingualism is an extraordinary gift we can give children. We know it's good for them and we know how to do it. If we don't do it, well, shame on us and shame on our, our generation. There, there's little question in my mind that um, the United States will become a majority bilingual nation. The only question in my mind is how long it will take. Mm -hmm. We could do it in one generation if we set our minds to it, uh, but it may take longer than that. And as far as um, the impact on the country, I think it will be a, a, a gloriously good impact. I, the way I view it, English brings us together. English unites us. 
our other languages define and strengthen us. Absolutely. And I, I, I think it's a, uh, I'm very optimistic for this uh, America's bilingual century. Well, we are too, and we're still, we're still out there preaching. Um, and um, Edvidge, would you show the book again before we close? Yes, absolutely. Here's the book. We highly recommend it. We enjoyed it very much. The teachers who attended the book club also enjoyed it very much, uh, enjoyed the metaphors, uh, enjoyed the stories. It's a, it's a wonderful read. It's a really wonderful I mean, read. I was so inspired. You can ask Edvidge. I was just blabbing about it every time we talked and telling everybody to read it, my friends, um, especially those of us in the language learning community. It's just, it speaks to our soul and our hearts. And we're so happy that you're, you're out there um, talking about this and exposing it to, to the rest of the country. Well, well, thank you, Karen and, and Edwidge. And it's a, I feel very honored to be having uh, my encore career in, in your field of uh, talking about American bilingualism and promoting it. Uh, it's should never also too mention, late, right? It's never, it's never too late. Never too late. The book uh, is also available in digital and audio. In fact, the audio version, I think, is my favorite. It's read by Sean Pratt, and uh, he's the Zen master of audio, so you don't have to listen to me reading it. <laughs> Well, that's great. And um, I want to thank everybody. Uh, if Steve, is there anything else you would like to share with us? Because we do have four minutes. No, I, I appreciate it. Nobody uh, gets upset about ending a Zoom call early. I, I think this is a universal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I can't tell you again how much we enjoy the book. We love speaking with you. I personally, I'm sure Edvidge and I could sit here for hours and talk until the evening and have a glass of wine and see how much more fluent we get. Now right, that but that'll, that'll be another time. <laughs> um, I want to thank everybody on this call. We appreciate you taking the time. I hope you got something out of it. I'm sure you did. And um, Edvidge will be following up with um, some information. And also, we'd like to ask you what you thought about it. So thanks again. And everybody stay safe and healthy. And remember, it's, ne it's never too late. Never too late. Thank you so much, Karen and Edwidge. I really, as you can tell, I enjoy talking about this. It's a, a, an honor to be uh, speaking with you and your colleagues and your students. So well, thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Have a great day, everyone. Adios. Adios. <laughs>